think we're good to go. Um, we'll have some folks who will join us, I'm sure, in a minute. But I'd like to welcome everyone to a conversation on careers presented by the alumni offices of the Berkeley Carroll School, Brooklyn Friends School, Holly Prep Country Day School, the Packer Collegiate, and St. Anne's School. My name is Jamie O'Regan. I am the Director of Alumni Relations at the Berkeley Carroll School, and it's my pleasure to help moderate and lead this conversation this evening. I want to let everyone know that there is a Q&A feature enabled on the bottom, so feel free to submit questions there. We do have the questions for folks who filled out the forms in advance, and we will try to get to as many as possible through our panelists, as well as through uh, you know, the Q&A feature at the end of this evening. Each of our panelists will go through, do a short presentation, and then we'll get to questions then. So it's my pleasure to tee it up to our first panelist, Peter. Thank you so much. I am Peter Lafter, and I have spent uh, most of my career working in the staffing and recruiting industry, and I'm quite passionate about uh, people's job search for a couple reasons. One, looking for work sucks, and, and it's hard, and it's, it's difficult to be, to be scrutinized in the way that you are. And it's not, and, and interviewing is generally not how we make big life decisions. We see our coworkers more than we do our family, but I did not choose my spouse based on a couple 45 minute conversations. So it's a, an unnatural process uh, that we have to work through. And I also just want to recognize that it is a really scary time to be looking for work, particularly if you're just starting your career or if you have lost your job. Uh, the news about coronavirus and just the millions upon millions of people who are out of work is just downright disheartening, disheartening and upsetting. And so I just want to acknowledge that we're in this weird time and also don't worry. You know, they're there with some slight tweaks to your job search and looking at it in a different way. You definitely can have a successful uh, career search. Might take a little longer. You might have to go about it differently, but it can be done even in, in, in bad times. So just to leave you with that, I'm going to be primarily speaking about networking. And I think networking, if you don't have a networking component to your job search, you want to add that. Uh, it, it is probably one of the more effective ways, but albeit a little bit difficult to find a job. And in fact, 70% of, of most hires are made through uh, networking or referrals. So it is, it is by far the most common way for people to get hired. And in fact, if your strategy is just looking uh, or submitting your resume to job openings, only 15% of job openings actually make it to job boards. So um, with networking, it is, it's really critical um, you know, that you add that to your, your, your portfolio and your, your job search. And I think uh, why it's, it's so effective is the first thing that hiring managers do when they are, have an opening is say, who do we know? And, and the, why they ask those questions in that particular way is first and foremost, most people, most hiring managers actually don't know how to interview and they don't know how to hire. So it has a, there's a tremendous amount of fear about making an, uh, a decision based on someone who they don't have any background with. So go, going to people that they know who are likely to know good people is, offers a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, comfort. And what's more is it's just, it's a lot easier and a lot faster. So your job as a networker is to have your name front of mind to the people who are asked that question. Hey, I have to hire someone to do X, who do you know? Yeah, and there's some real simple ways to do that, and, but there's some real uh, you know, things you need to keep in mind. And I think looking at what networking is and what it isn't is the first step. So many people think of networking is, is knowing a bunch of people that I can ask for help when I need help. And I want to assure you that is not what networking is. Networking, the analogy that you want to look at is more like a bank account. You can only make withdrawals after you've made deposits. You have to actually pay into your network before you can make requests. And I'm, I'm sure we've all had the, you know, the, the experience where someone we haven't heard from in a while calls us and asks us a favor like, hey, I just rented a U-Haul and can you help me move my couch on Saturday? And, and if it's someone you haven't heard from in a while or someone you don't have a connection to, the answer to that question is always always no. I got to wash my cat. I got to file my nails. I got to do anything other than move your stupid couch because 
I don't know you and I'm not going to help you. And it's an automatic reaction that people have. But when, when you're approached by someone who's consistently provided value, the answer is always, how can I help? So um, the, the first key to, to networking is knowing that it is about providing value first, before, uh, which enables you to ask for help. And a lot of you who are just starting your career you know, might ask, well, I'm just starting my career. What, is it, what value could I possibly have to offer? Don't worry. The, the most valuable thing that you can provide to your network is actually your network. So offering introductions to people uh, who are like-minded, who can provide value, is probably the easiest and most effective thing that you can do when you're networking. So um, being you know, very, very clear on, on, on who you're talking to and making sure when you're interacting with people in a networking capacity that you're asking them, what type of people can advance your career? What type of people are you, you know, are you interested in meeting? What is it that you're looking to accomplish? Uh, so, you know, and so if you know those people, uh, then you can offer to make introductions. Or as you continue to network and you meet people who can provide value in that area, you can offer you know, to make future introductions and circle back to people that you've networked. So I think making introductions is the single most uh, important thing you, do, you can do. And know that it has a compounding effect. Yeah, if I, uh, if, if I offer to make an introduction uh, between a client and uh, a contact in my network, and I make that introduction, now both of those people now view me as someone who provides value. So I am not just providing value to the person I'm networking with, but I'm also providing the person who's in value to the person is my network by making that introduction. So you have this compounding effect. The more introductions you make, you know, the more that you can ask of your network. The other areas where you can provide value pretty consistently are, are providing content. Primarily, you are going to be you know, looking in, in what your area of focus, the job that you want to find, and that's going to, you know, you're going to be finding content. Sharing that content, cur curating that content is going to be very valuable. And if you've identified companies, particularly larger companies, that, have, uh, that you want to work for, know that most companies offer referral bonuses. So starting your networking conversations with people within your target companies with just asking the questions, hey, I don't know if company X offers a, an internal uh, referral bonus, but I, as I'm looking for work there, I thought you and I should speak. So right off the bat, you're able to provide some value. Um, or, you know, the referral bonuses are significant you know, and in many cases and can make a big difference for someone. So that's an area where you can buy value. So where to start on your networking career? I think first and foremost, you have to be able to define your ideal job and you want to be able to do so succinctly. So be ab absolutely clear on what it is that you're looking for and what type of people are going to hire for those and what type of people know those folks. So you, and, uh, and you want to do that for a couple of different reasons. You want to have that clarity. So first and foremost, when you're talking to people about what you're looking for, you can say it succinctly. You need one or two sentences. I'm looking to work in this field in a job that, that provides these type of opportunities where I can use these skills. Something that simple and that clear. And that one gives you clarity on what to look for, but it also allows people in your network and gives them clarity on, on what, um, uh, yeah, on, on who they you know, should be looking for. Um, which is which is which is absolutely uh, critical, um, and then you want to be clear on who interacts with that type of person. Um, who are the folks that are interested in that? And spend some time thinking about what type of things are they uh, might they be interested? Uh, where where they are? Can you interact with them uh, on on social media? You know, can you find forms where people are asking questions? Yeah. You know, are you aware of those questions? Can you can you provide answers to those questions? Um, can you know? And and then also asking people for in your network for introductions. And you want to make this very very specific request. If if I know Julie and Julie knows some uh, Samantha and I want to meet Samantha, yeah, you know, I obviously I'm going to go to Julie. But I want to make it really easy for her to say yes, and I want to make it easy for her to provide that introduction. So when I ask you know, someone for an introduction, I will say, 
hey, I noticed that you're connected to this person. This is why I want to meet with them. And, um, and if you're willing to make the introduction, I will send you a note that you can just copy and paste and send in an email. Um, you know, so you want to make it as easy as possible for the people who you're asking introductions you know, to make, um, uh, to make intro, uh, lists. Um, the other critical thing is you want to have, in addition to the target type of person and job that you're looking for, you want to very, very specifically target the, um, the companies that you want to work with. And um, and you know and make sure that you're keeping up to date with who's there, what are they doing, you know, so you can engage with those people. And I think you know med, uh, networking is it's like working out or meditation. It it never really works if you're just doing it sporadically. It is a uh, it is a discipline that you have to engage in on a regular basis, with an eye to look for where is it that I can provide value to people in my network. Where is it that I can uh, I can give into my network so that when I need it I can I can uh, make requests from those people, um, and that is my 10 minutes. I hope this was helpful. I'm looking forward to asking your questions. I think we're we're in for a real treat. I think one of the greatest networking tools ever created is LinkedIn, and Barry, who will be speaking next, is uh, a senior senior manager of social impact at, at LinkedIn. And she's got a pretty fantastic presentation for us. So thank you so much. And Barry, it's, it's all you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for sharing the gospel of networking. Obviously, at LinkedIn, that's what we're all about. So I'd love to talk today for a bit about, first, how you build your online presence on LinkedIn to show up well in your job search and throughout your career and then talk about how tactically you can build your network on LinkedIn to apply some of the skills and tools that Peter mentioned. So I'm gonna share my screen because I think it will be helpful to um, be able to see the parts of LinkedIn that I'm talking about. Um, all right. So as Peter mentioned, I am on the social impact team at LinkedIn, and we're focused on helping job seekers connect to the resources and networks they need to build meaningful careers. And I think that LinkedIn is always important because nine out of 10 hiring managers use LinkedIn. They're either finding their candidates for jobs on LinkedIn or after they've received a resume, they're double checking the information on LinkedIn and sending the URL to colleagues. But it feels even more critical now that we're all confined to our homes and we can't go to in-person networking events and meet and mingle with people in the same way. So often your online presence is what you're going to lead with when you are developing relationships or applying for jobs. So let's first talk about building your LinkedIn profile, which I know is intimidating for some folks and I totally understand and mine was blank until I had to start at LinkedIn and, and that wasn't going to cut it anymore. So first I'll talk about what's different between a LinkedIn profile and your resume. So it is possible to copy paste some information from your resume to your profile. For example, when you're adding your experience section, it's totally fine to copy paste the bullet points from your resume onto LinkedIn. But what's different is that your LinkedIn profile speaks to all employers. You can't customize it for particular jobs. And it goes into more detail. So you can add you know, some summary information about what you're interested in, sort of develop yourself as more of a well-rounded person than a sheet of paper. Folks can contact you and add recommendations to your profile. They can endorse you for specific skills and you can include rich media. So if there is a PDF or a link or a website you've developed that you're really excited about, you can add that to LinkedIn. So it can be much more dynamic and ever changing than a resume. And important to use it to your full potential so you stand out during the job search. One of the first things you tell people to do when they're developing their LinkedIn profile is taking a great photo. So basically everyone can take a great photo with their phone these days. And we know that members of profile photos receive up to 21 times more views and nine times more connection requests. So it does matter 
And it matters that your picture is professional, you're dressed for the job you want, and it's just you. It's not you and your dog or, or you and a group of people. Once you have your photo down, you can start working on the content. So you can add your location and industry. I recommend if you're looking to transition to a new industry that you include that on your profile and you can explain on the profile that that's your intended goal. You can add your work and internship experience. You can add volunteer experience. 40% of hiring managers actually believe that volunteer experience is just as important and valuable as paid experience. So even if you haven't been working for a while or you're new to the workforce, you can include anything that you've done for neighbors or at your church or your school because that shows how you've been spending your time and the skills you've developed. Of course, add your education, um, any skills that you have and any organizations that you've been part of. Again, all of that makes you seem more well-rounded and as I'll show you, it makes it easier for you to build your network on the LinkedIn platform. Now the summary is, um, or excuse me, the headline first, I should get to that. So that's that line that appears when you're searching for someone on LinkedIn, it's right under their profile. It'll default to what your actual job is. So for me, it'll say senior manager of social impact at LinkedIn, but there's an opportunity for it to say more about you and for it to represent your professional brand. So some people will say, as you can see here, design thinking meets business strategy because they believe you know they're a multi-rounded professional you might say recent graduate and aspiring filmmaker if there's something that is not your job title yet but you hope that it will be in the future or you can just use something descriptive about what your vision is or your mission and the work you're doing so empowering the global workforce at LinkedIn. That's not his actual job title, but it gives us a sense of what he's passionate about and makes me more interested in talking to him, at least to find out what he actually does. So this is a good place to get a little creative. Now the summary section, which I was excited to get to, is I think the most intimidating part of your profile because it's a totally blank box. A lot of people don't fill it out at all. But I like to use a formula that breaks it down and makes it a little bit more accessible. So I think in your summary section, where is the place, is the place you can really make yourself come alive, you should include one to two sentences about who you are. Um, so just, I'm Barry Lumber, or rather you don't need to put your name, but you can say, I'm a social impact lead at LinkedIn and I'm focused on XYZ. Then spend a few sentences talking about your experience, your top skills and passions, and um, how you develop those. So what are actually the qualifications that have made you into the person you are today? And finally, include a couple sentences about your future goals. So why are you on LinkedIn? Are you interested in transitioning to a new industry and you want to meet people in that industry? Are you interested in coaching and mentoring? If so, you can say, please reach out to me if you're interested in finding a coach or a mentor. I'd love to build relationships. If, as Peter said, you're just trying to strengthen your network by investing in it now, you can say, reach out if, if I can help you. Um, I'm just looking to you know, build my network. So again, makes people understand why or how they should reach out to you and gives you more of a sense of being a real human being than than just a page or a sheet of paper. So you have your LinkedIn profile, great. Now you can actually capture or build your professional network on LinkedIn. There is a, a big reason that we recommend this and Peter spoke to it a bit around you know, how important networking is these days. And we know from our own data that you're four times more likely to get a job at a company where you already have connections. And that could be because someone's putting in a good word and hooking up the job for you. It could be because you know, they're at least bringing your resume to the top so the recruiter will call you and it's not overlooked by the system. It could also be that they're just telling you more about the company so you can stand out more in interviews. Whatever it is, we know that who you know matters as much as what you know, if not more. So a few ways that you can add connections to your LinkedIn profile are by going to the My Network tab. So you can see here that's on your LinkedIn homepage, on your phone app or on desktop. 
And you'll find here current and former colleagues, alumni from the schools you went to, if you added the schools to your profile, um, friends and family, and we'll try to recommend people to you, which some people think is a little creepy, but it actually can make it a little bit easier to add people to your network if you forget that um, you actually have a relationship with them. If they're not showing up organically, you can search for new connections. So you could search for Berkeley Carroll, which is where I went to school, and you know, see who shows up as people that I knew from the Berkeley Carroll community, or search for people who previously um, were at your company and you're interested in reconnecting with. You can also search for new connections. So if you want to connect with someone who you just met, you can obviously type their name into the search box. But if you want to connect with someone totally new that you hope to learn from, you can search for, ta for you know, the type of job you're interested in. So if I'm interested in going into marketing at Google, I could search for marketing in Google, maybe see if there's anyone who went to an independent school in Brooklyn, and then send them a note. And I would say that it's critical to include a personalized note whenever you send a connection request to people on LinkedIn. First of all, it gives them some context if they might not remember where you're from. And second of all, if you haven't met them at all, it gives them a reason to not totally ignore their request. And personally, if someone sends me a connection request and I don't know them, it's not really compelling to accept them because I want to make sure my network is people that, you know, I, I have an established relationship with for a reason, because at any point someone could reach out and say, oh, you're connected to Peter. Would you refer him for a job? And if I've literally never interacted with Peter and he never sent a note, I'm just confused about why we're connected. So important to customize that note when you reach out. And finally, I think one of the best things you can do with your network, either on LinkedIn or off LinkedIn, is ask for informational interviews. And in case you're not familiar with the term, an informational interview is an opportunity to learn more about a career path or an industry or a company that you're interested in and to establish a relationship with someone without it being too transactional. Because to Peter's point, no one wants to just help someone if they don't have a, a prior relationship, typically. Um, so an informational interview is an opportunity to spend 20 minutes with someone whose career inspires you, learning about their job. And it's possible down the road, they will hook you up with a job, even if it doesn't happen right during that first conversation you're really laying the foundation for future rewards. So this is a template that you could use to reach out to someone and just say, you know, I'm inspired by your experience in this industry and I'm exploring jobs in this industry. I'd love to learn more about your journey and would you be open to a 20 minute conversation? And people love talking about themselves. So if you'll probably find that it's not too hard to get people to respond. Um, especially if you already have something in common, like you went to the same school. Um, so once you've done these steps, you'll obviously be better set up for the job search phase. And I'm going to pass it over to Ariyami, our final panelist, who's the founder and CEO of ASMT Solutions. And he's going to talk more about getting through that job search. Thank you so much, Barry. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. So uh, again, my name is Adi Emi, uh, and I'm the founder and CEO of ASMT Solutions and uh, we're a human capital consulting firm uh, and we work with organizations to help them build and retain uh, talent. And we also work with individuals uh, in, in professional coaching capacity uh, with an emphasis on underrepresented talent. Uh, and throughout my career, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with thousands of candidates and, and hundreds of hiring managers. So uh, to echo what Peter mentioned earlier, the job search process can be so daunting. Uh, and, and oftentimes it can feel like a full-time job. So it, it's important to just set yourself up for success by budgeting your time, staying organized, uh, and having some kind of clear action items as you're uh, looking for, for your next job opportunity. So our natural inclination is to jump to job boards uh, and, and find uh, a job posting out there. 
Uh, but really before you get to that step, it's important to do research uh, into particular industries and companies that you're interested in. Uh, things, consumer brands that stand out to you uh, that you may like and use on a day-to-day -day basis have a corporate side. So look into them and, and see uh, what sort of organizational structure they have and business model. And uh, as you're learning, what you're really doing is setting yourself up for the future stages of the, of the interview process. So do that research uh, and then through that uh, as as Barry mentioned, you have opportunities to build your brand on LinkedIn and make connections with folks at those companies, follow them, uh, you know, make sure that you're staying up to date on their, uh, on their content. And to keep in mind as well, you don't have to be in healthcare uh, and, and be a nurse or a doctor or a medical professional, right? Uh, you don't actually have to be an engineer to work at a tech company. So as you're doing research, just keep an open mind to understand that all, all companies uh, need different levels and, and type of talent. Um, through that research, what I often hear from candidates is, wow, I didn't even know this company existed. Or I didn't know that I could do marketing at a construction firm, right? So uh, keep your mind open uh, in that sense. The job boards, uh, again, are a good place uh, to see who's hiring, um, but the systems are not really set up to support candidates. 75% uh, of applications are immediately eliminated uh, from, from a system before they even make it to a recruiter or to any sort of interview. So uh, the, the numbers are not, not set up uh, in a way that you should rely on those job boards. And so again, uh, having some research done, you're better equipped to, to build connections, make relationships uh, within, within a specific industry or uh, with a company. Uh, building relationships with recruiters as well, uh, not just those that work internally at an organization, but uh, agencies. Uh, so the uh, staffing and recruiting industry is a billion dollar industry and there are tons of firms, large and small, uh, who work with multiple companies. So you making a relationship with two recruiters at an agency could open you up to dozens of new companies and access to job opportunities uh, you may not have seen before. Uh, and also they can be an advocate for you throughout the, the process. So, uh, you know, all of this is before you even submit apply uh, on, the, on any sort of job board. So, uh, so let's get to it, right? You find a, a, a good role, it seems like a good fit for you and you're ready to apply. Um, of course, uh, knowing your resume is gonna be a key portion of that, oftentimes LinkedIn. Uh, so to echo what Barry said about getting your experiences and skills and thinking about your summary and headlines and how you wanna present yourself uh, to your next employer, your resume uh, must be tailored and customized. Uh, so it's best practice to have one master resume where you can kind of house all the information, uh, all the great projects you've worked on, and it can be much longer. Uh, and so you don't have to, uh, to limit yourself on, on size. And then you want to start to tailor it for certain types of roles uh, and also certain industries if, uh, if that's relevant. And so again, that research you did earlier, plays into how to uh, how to tailor your, your uh, resume. And then it's that customization piece. So before you submit apply, you really want to spend 10 minutes, maybe even more, putting your resume up side by side with the job description and saying, okay, where do I meet those qualifications? Uh, where are those responsibilities? How can I find a particular project that showcases my experience and, and demonstrates my competency. So it can be uh, it can be frustrating to keep looking at this resume and looking at this resume. Uh, but what I'll tell you on the other side is there's nothing worse than seeing a candidate that has no transferable experience, right, or even has errors on their resume. So there's always benefits to going and spending that additional time. Um, but to align that resume to the job description increases uh, your chance of success 
uh, and start to use the specific words even. So uh, oftentimes systems as well as recruiters are using key words to identify candidates. They're using those words to evaluate potential fit. So make sure that uh, there are at least some words that you see on the job description reflected in your resume. Uh, please don't force it. If it doesn't sound natural to you, it's going to sound the same uh, to the person reading it. So make sure that it's authentic to, uh, to, to what your work was, but uh, use that as a little bit of um, an indicator on how to match uh, your, your background with certain roles. Uh, and also in that process, I encourage folks to do a little bit of a skills audit. Uh, what you did in your job two years ago is going to be reflected differently uh, today. And you're going to think about it differently. You're going to have different words and different framing around that experience. So uh, sometimes folks may have been on a special project committee internally at a company and it was around uh, marketing. And two years later, they're now in a marketing role or trying to pivot into that industry that last project, uh, although earlier in their career may not have seen that relevant, it was just a small set of their time, it actually shows that they've been building and there's that progressive experience. So do a little bit of skills audit, uh, give yourself on a pat, pat on the back, that's okay. Uh, this is where you can brag a little bit, um, but it helps you tailor that experience. So uh, you've got your resume down pat, uh, now you're going to have to talk to folks. <laughs> Someone's going to ask you about your experience. So, uh, of course, do your preparation. Um, continue to do that research, right? So that translates through to this stage. Um, uh, like Peter mentioned, uh, the networking is so beneficial uh, as you're trying to uh, navigate uh, job search and uh, the actual interview process. So network with folks at the company, learn more about uh, what's going on, about their business plans, and, and see how you can uh, really set yourself up uh, as a unique candidate. Being clear about your story as well. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, every part of your professional journey is yours, and, uh, and it does have value. Uh, and you never know what's going to resonate with somebody uh, that you're going to speak with. So to the extent you're comfortable, share uh, how you have moved from certain positions and maybe there were tough work environments uh, that you actually learn from now and you're better able to deal with conflict. Uh, so just think about where are the where are the parts of your story that you can really explain and, and showcase your fit. Um, and then the most important thing is to interview for the job uh, that you're applying for. And so there's always going to be room for a company to say, well, you're not necessarily a good fit for this role, but there may be another opening. Uh, but make sure that as you're talking to hiring managers and recruiters that you're focused on that job description uh, and the way they are framing the role. Um, you may have tons of other interests and be very capable at other things, but you want to narrow that down uh, so that those that key message is, is getting out there. And then as you're getting towards the end and you are thinking about uh, the potential offer terms and uh, possibly negotiating your compensation package, uh, just be very clear uh, about what you're looking for. Um, do a little bit of your own research and competitive analysis to uh, to see what the salary should be, talk to folks in uh, in similar roles. And also think about uh, some of the non-monetary factors. So think about what's going to be important for your location. Are you going to have to move? Uh, do you have uh, you know specific benefits that you're going to need? Obviously, we've all become uh, accustomed to the remote work life work lifestyle, and some companies are going to stick with it and uh, and understanding that there's still going to be some changes. Are there things about your remote work setup that you'd like support on? So all of those things can happen in uh, the offer negotiation phase. And uh, I know it's like you're almost at the finish line. And so you just want to get through. Uh, totally reasonable. Uh, everyone's been there. But don't forget that last stage so that you can really make sure you're in that role for the long term. Uh, or at least that you're able to feel comfortable and energized walking uh, into that into that next position. So 
Uh, it's certainly a tough time uh, to even be talking about careers. And uh, the fact that you're here listening uh, shows that you want to get more information uh, and you are in a position to take hold of your career, which is most important. Um, I, I, I want to share that although uh, the economy looks bleak and uh, unemployment has surely been staggering, uh, there are consistently jobs out there uh, and people are consistently hiring. So you may want to think about some of these industries that are emerging and actually on the increase in this market, including uh, our grocery delivery services, right? Uh, they, they need marketers and accountants and business operations professionals just the same. They need the folks who are frontline. Um, think about your online, online learning. Think about Zoom, right? Of course, uh, this platform we're able to use so much. Uh, so I just want to encourage folks, I know things can be bleak, but try to identify where there are opportunity areas and uh, throughout your job search and your professional journey, uh, be sure to leverage that network, really bolster your employee, your professional brand on LinkedIn so that employers are able to engage with you uh, and, and be systematic as you're moving through uh, the actual hiring and, and interview process. Uh, and, and be sure that you are uh, going to be uh, a standout candidate. Thank you so much. Great, thank you all so much. This has been so helpful. Um, I have a few questions that I know came in beforehand and please feel free to keep adding some to the chat feature at the bottom. But the first question I have, I'm gonna actually tee up to Peter. Um, I know that there are individuals who are looking for ways to pivot Maybe they're either small business owners looking for ways to utilize their skill sets, uh, if they've been recently unemployed or laid off, or just thinking about how to be more creative given the current market. What recommendations might you have about uh, how to network from that perspective as a maybe growing your brand and how to reach out to people on the offensive instead of as a, a job search candidate? Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit on that question, and I think one of the things, because that's a particularly, you know, I mean, you know, uh, I run a small business as well, and uh, this is a scary time. So as you, you know, are looking at things, I think one of the best questions to ask uh, yourself when you're thinking about a, a new new career or new industry is 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 what is it that that comes easy to me that is challenging for other people. And I think that's, that's a, a great start you know, to, to look at that because we all have strengths that are, you know, and we all tend to discount our strengths, um, particularly you know, if you've been in a small business uh, for a couple of years and uh, you've been doing it, you have this bias where you start to think, oh, I can do that, therefore everybody can do it, or it's not that special. Not at all the case. So, so that simple question, what can I do you know, that comes easy to me, that is challenging for everybody else is, a, is an awesome place to start. And then really just start looking at, at that ability and skill. Where can it be applied? Uh, LinkedIn has some really great search tools. So you can actually, you know, can you do some search job searches for not necessarily for, for skills and attributes? Um, so you're forgetting about job titles, but you're really looking at, well, where are the job titles that require this particular uh, particular skill. And, and, and I find, you know, there are particularly nowadays, there's people are more willing to talk than ever. So just saying, look, I'm really good at this. Where are areas where you think I'd best apply that, that particular skill? I hope that answers your question. No, I think, I think that was wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Bari, a question for you. I know that it came up in the chat, but I also want to make sure we call attention to it too. How is the best way for folks to be presenting on LinkedIn a bit more of their hard and soft skills, be it their voluntary skills, things that they've done that maybe aren't directly work related, but might be uh, something that would be helpful for a prospective employer or someone who might be recommending you as someone within your network to, to take a look at and to see? Yeah, it's a great question. So technically, there is a whole section on your LinkedIn profile called volunteer experience, and you can add that section. I also wouldn't shy away if it's your most recent experience or it's really substantive experience from just putting it under the experience section. 
So folks don't have to scroll down as, as far to see it. There are definitely users who do that. And then in your summary section, you can also tell more of a story about the work you do. So I love when people will say, you know, I have X years of experience in marketing. Outside of work, I'm really passionate about volunteering with big brothers, big sisters, and I've had five little brothers over the past 10 years. I think something like that really makes a candidate come alive. And I might be biased because I'm in the social impact space, but that makes me much more excited about talking to someone when I'm hiring. So use the summary space for that. And another way to, to show the volunteer experience you have or your passions is to be really active with your LinkedIn community. So post in the feed. Um, this doesn't have to be like long essays that you write. It could just be articles that are interesting to you and you include a couple of lines and just sharing content that's valuable and could be valuable to your network really gives people a sense of what you're all about. And if you are adding value to them by putting content in front of them, you know, they might also think more favorably that you might be adding to that, to that bank account Peter mentioned. Um, so sharing content, really becoming an active member of LinkedIn instead of just a static profile. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in, and I'm going to tee it up to Adiyami, since you talked a bit about resumes and that sort of stuff. Uh, how do you feel about what a resume looks like? Is it important that it's dynamic visually, colors, black and white? Should I use stay away from certain graphics or trends? Uh, in particular, there are plenty of websites. Uh, the person who asked this question picked one that I'm a fan of, Canva, that has a lot of templates. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are your thoughts and recommendations around that? So the most important, I think, element of your link of your resume, other than um, the actual content, is your LinkedIn profile. I think if you can link to that on there, uh, it's a really big uh, help. And just from a process standpoint, a recruiter can literally just get you through uh, a little bit faster with that link. Um, in terms of design, it's best suited for. Um, for roles and industries where design is important, right? So uh, I think when you have graphics and you have more creative uh, formatting, uh, when you're looking at marketing jobs, when you're in media, uh, a lot of uh, content producers uh, that I work with will have design elements to their resume. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's no one rule that governs resumes. And so I would spend less time even thinking about the format <laughs> and more about the content, uh, which can be tricky. So I don't think you'll ever be in a position where you're eliminated from a, a process because your resume has some, uh, some design elements and is not black and white. Uh, the key, I would say, is in terms of length. Uh, and please, please, please get it to one page. Um, which I know is tough, but uh, I've worked with executives that have 15 to 20 years of experience and uh, you could imagine there it's difficult to get it one down in one page, but they do. Uh, and so always keep that master resume so that you don't lose the information, but uh, it's best and, and most efficient if you can get it to uh, to that one page. I, I want to just uh, add yeah, to strength to strengthen that one page is is, is absolutely critical. And just think, how often have you gone to a second page of your Google search? It's the same content. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, I have another question, um, and I'm going to tee this up to the three of you, uh, whoever it might speak to the most. But given the heightened level of uh, social issues and the current climate that's going on. I know a lot of job seekers are interested more about companies' mission and vision and how to look into that a bit more and perhaps aligning their professional trajectory, even if it doesn't seem uh, as natural on the surface, to do a better deep dive into an organization and what they support. What tips um, can you give to individuals when they're in this part of the career search? Maybe it's looking at, um, CSR and ways that they give back to the community, um, their mission and vision beyond those kind of things you might do on the surface. Are there any helpful tips that you can share with folks about that? 
I'm happy to, to speak to that first. Um, I think that it's definitely helpful to look at a company's uh, CSR efforts or corporate social responsibility and sustainability efforts on their site. But I can tell you on the CSR team that, you know, what teams say isn't necessarily what's actually going on and being funded. Luckily, this day and age, there is a um, very critical culture um, online. And there are also journalists who are doing the work and calling out companies that are putting out great statements, but aren't actually investing in the programs that they need to be. So I would encourage doing your due diligence, Google searching, looking for new sources. I would also encourage you to look at leadership and their background and specifically if let's say representation when it comes to race, ethnicity, gender, ability is important to you, looking at the boards or the executive leadership of those companies. Um, I think recently that's come out as um, you know, a, a pretty big disparity looking at companies that are making statements in support of racial justice, but not doing the work to, um, you know, hire black and brown employees. So um, investing in that. Um, and I think there are companies where, you know, you just are going to get the sense that your priorities don't align. And I think you should feel empowered not to move forward with those companies. Um, I also think there are companies where no one has, it's particularly if they're small, no one has done this work yet, but there is appetite to. And so that's something to feel out in interviews. Like if there's no CSR or social impact team yet, but you bring it up in an interview as a side project you might be interested in, is there enthusiasm around that? When you ask about diversity and inclusion, when you're talking to a recruiter, is there enthusiasm or do they sort of brush it off? Um, and I think then you can get a sense of whether even at a small company, they'd be excited to have someone there who wants to invest in the work. And it's, um, you know, not really a, a lack of interest issue, but um, perhaps just a lack of bandwidth or a lack of resources to date, but could be an opportunity to make change from within. Um, Peter and Ariane, feel free to jump in with any other thoughts on that. You know, I, I, I spoke to uh, uh, an analyst at Montley Fool who says one of his greatest uh, indicators for looking at what companies to invest in is their, their, uh, their Glassdoor uh, ratings. Yeah, and so I think that that's, that's a, an easy, easy place, but also your, your own uh, smell test as you're doing your networking. Uh, you're you're going to see corporate uh, statements from corporations and there's some of them they are just going to strike you as false or just found, found right hollow. Yeah, follow those instincts. I think that, yeah, I think uh, people. And then the other thing is, is how do they treat you in the job search process? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a it, it's, I think, you know, corporate responsibility is, is really important, but yeah, you really want to know how you're going to be treated and, and people tell you everything you need to know from the beginning. So, yeah, if, if they, they keep you waiting for a long time, take note. That doesn't mean you're going to turn a job. Uh, if they don't respond to you after you submit your resume, take note. If your candidate experience is bad, take note. Uh, yeah, to, to echo what both of you said, having the conversations uh, is most important. So uh, having conversations with current employees uh, and having those conversations throughout your interview process. So remember that you're also screening and evaluating this employer this team, this company. And so you are well within your right to ask questions uh, that matter to you around diversity and equity. And um, oftentimes my, my clients come to me to help solve some of the challenges that they have around talent. And our conversations stem from how are they prepared to talk to candidates, right? So I wanna know from my hiring teams and, and leadership and execs, how they are gonna be prepared to talk about uh, not just the racial and implicit bias training that they may have done last week, but what their immediate and long-term goals are. So be, be judicious in terms of uh, that due diligence that Barry mentioned earlier and really uh, asking those questions, having, having that type of dialogue. Also, I, I would encourage you to 
uh, get clear for yourself uh, about what matters most to you. And so there's a lot of conversation out there now and there will be forever uh, about what the obligations are of companies and, and how they should engage with society. But be clear about what's important to you. Is service uh, a priority? And do you wanna make sure uh, that in your next role, a company gives you uh, a community service day a quarter, or do they have a backing program where if you donate uh, to a nonprofit of your choice, they'll actually match that? Um, you know, are you more uh, more interested in uh, internal programming and uh, and and ERGs, employee resource groups, and and how they're managing their budgets and and uh, planning programming? So because there are so many ways to think about a, your next company and, and organization's responsibility, uh, try to narrow in on what matters most to you. And then you're able to, uh, to ask that, the, that type of information and, and get that uh, as you're interviewing and, and considering making that move. Great, thank you all. That was a really helpful, you know, comprehensive response. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So this is going to be the last question of the evening, but it's to all of you. And um, how do you approach this whole process? And that's what it is, a process. Uh, most people are not going to be finding a job overnight. And so what can you give personal advice to each of the folks who might be here as to how to stay motivated and not get discouraged uh, as they're going through all of this. So let's let's go in order. So I'll, we'll tee it back up to you, Peter. Okay, so I think, yeah, you know, one being absolutely clear on what you're looking for and and then uh, is I think the, the number one thing. Um, and being able to 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 focus on on the companies that that will offer those opportunities the type of people who will be hiring for that um, and having that knowledge is going to shift that and making sure that you're spending a specific and set and manageable amount of time you know working you know to to find that so you've you know you yeah, if you're if you're sending your your resume in to jobs that you've got a specific time, you know that you're doing that uh, every day, and that you're setting a set time for for networking. Uh, a job search is is a marathon; it rarely is a sprint. Sometimes you'll get lucky, uh, but you you want to just know that it's going to take you know daily and regular work. And so just you know set yourself your expectation, you know that you're going to do that. But on the flip side don't put so much time into it on a daily basis that it becomes you know, completely unmanageable for you. Um, so you wanna set specific times, whatever, whatever works for you that, that you can do on a daily basis, do at least that, whether it's 20 minutes yeah, or what have you, but just make sure that you're, you're, you're spending that, that, that time on a regular basis. I was gonna say, similar to Peter, set up a, a project plan like you would for any project in the workplace and um you know set up set it up in chunks so you don't feel like the same day you have to edit your resume and apply to 20 jobs and build 20 new relationships but instead maybe the first week it's all about research looking at industries that are actually growing right now looking collecting the jobs you're interested in collecting people you want to talk to and then the next week or the next two days are about editing your resume and sending it to friends and family for feedback and then you can sort of check off those those items, which if you're like me feels really good just to cross something off your list. And I would also say be mindful of your energy. And if having conversations with people and networking is really draining, maybe you do one a day and then the rest of the day you're taking an online course or you're working on your resume or doing something that isn't as draining so that you can reset. Um, I think the the hardest part is feeling burnt out um, and then you know to Peter's point you're not going to be able to sustain yourself for the marathon when it really is or can be a, a volume game and you might be in it for the long haul yeah and uh, to, to add on to that uh, if you're thinking about this as a project plan uh, and something that you are organizing you also want to analyze it and re reflect on it so as you're moving through the job search process figure out 
Um, what are the trends that you're seeing? Uh, where are you falling out of the pipeline? Is it you're not getting to the first round of recruiters or you're always getting past them and never to the hiring managers? Uh, think about where you're falling out and then you have an opportunity to course correct and say, all right, I got to start from ground zero here, right? Or I need to be uh, expanding uh, my network a little bit. Um, it, I would encourage you uh, that the job search process is also very, um, it can be very vulnerable for folks. Um, and so on top of like the time and energy, uh, it can be, you have to share a lot about yourself and also at the time where you need employment. And so that can be uh, kind of scary for folks as well. So just remember that your performance in the job search process has nothing to do with you as a person uh, and has nothing necessarily to do about you as a professional. Uh, the numbers are stacked against you. So getting no response or not getting callbacks or not moving forward doesn't mean that you're necessarily uh, a bad candidate. Uh, and I have folks who are, who I think are stellar, uh, and they tell me they've had this terrible experience through the interview process. And I'm saying, oh, well, we just haven't met yet. <laughs> uh, because had we been interviewing months ago, you would have gone through. So uh, just don't put so much weight on, on those things, but spend your time thinking and reflecting and seeing how, uh, how you can uh, enhance and, and definitely your uh, mental uh, capacity and, uh, and, and state is, is super important um, throughout. Well, this has been wonderful. Um, on behalf of all of my colleagues, Donna, David, Karen, uh, Anna, and Hannah, I'm, we want to thank all three of you panelists for joining us. This has been so enlightening and we hope the beginning of a conversation for many of you. We hope those of you who joined in found this helpful and please reach out to us and you know now where to find our panelists as well. If you have questions or, or you know, we didn't get to any of your questions this evening and you still have more, please let us know. Um, and in particular, our alumni offices are always here to help support you in these sorts of journeys. So have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you all again very soon.